Good morning from the United Nations in New York, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this conversation on rethinking property. While you're all settling in, and as Lini's mentioned, please do mute your microphones so that we have no background noise during the discussion. While you're settling in, let's watch a video which has been uh, prepared by the UN 75 team at the United Nations to start us off. Thank you for sharing the video with us. It referred to a new kind of challenge, and I think all of us in this virtual conference room know what exactly that means. We're in a world in June 2020 where 60 million more people have been driven into extreme poverty because of the COVID-19 crisis. We're in a world where 1.6 billion people, that's half the global workforce, are without livelihood. We're in a world where there's been a loss of eight and a half trillion dollars in global economic output. So you measure that against the icons that we saw in that film, the likes of Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela, and their call for social justice, which with it brought the idea of ending poverty. And today's conversation is really focused upon how we can rethink that ending of poverty and the bringing of social justice so that this new era brings with it not only the problems with which we are familiar, but also possible and sometimes unexpected solutions. To start us off this morning, we are privileged to have the permanent observer of the University for Peace to the United Nations, Ambassador Narendra Kakar. Ambassador Kakar, before his current assignment with the University for Peace, served for a number of years with the United Nations in virtually every part of the world. He began his career in Yemen. He went on to Guyana, went on to China, and then he was the UN resident coordinator in the Maldives. So he's really had first-hand experience both in addressing social justice and poverty at the national level, but beyond that, translating that into academic curriculum at the university where he works, and at the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, with whom he also served. So it's my privilege to give the floor to Ambassador Kakar. Thank you. Thanks for the, yes, for the introduction and uh, congratulations on organizing this event. Very important event during this fifth anniversary year of the United Nations. In the preamble, to his report to the UN General Assembly in 2015, transforming the world, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, former General Ban Ki-moon emphasized, and I quote, we are determined to end poverty and hunger in all the forms and dimensions, and to ensure that all human beings can fulfill their potential in dignity and quality and in health environment. Now, while global poverty has been cut by more than half since 2000, one in people in developing regions still lives on less than 
$1.90 a day. Uh, that is the internationally agreed poverty line. Although significant can, has, has been in many countries, countries. large, large of population in many countries continue to live below poverty line. Poverty entails, we must emphasize, more than lack of income and productive resources to ensure sustainable livelihoods. Its manifestations include hunger and malnutrition, limited access to education and other basic services, social dimensions and exclusion. The United Nations assessed that in 15, more than 736 million people lived below the international poverty line. Around 10% of the world population was living in extreme poverty and struggling to fulfill the most basic needs for health, education, and access to sanitation. Imagine there are 122 women between the ages of 25 and 34 living in poverty for every 100 men of the same age. That raises the question of social justice and equality. Now, as you know, I work for UNDP in many countries, and UNDP, as you know, provides assistance based on national priorities, but in any sector, not focusing on just one sector, health or food or you. And I was once asked a question that if I want to focus our assistance on one sector, focus our assistance on just one sector, what would that be? And for me, the obvious answer was education. And I uh, sort of elaborate more. Education and education for a girl child. More recent studies have, of course, improved our understanding of the role of education in development, no doubt. The interlinkage between education and aspects of human development are reflected in the SDGs framework. There are critical channels through which education affects other SDGs. At the same time, other SDGs also affect education. Perhaps the strongest link and the most important link, I would say, in this framework is between education and poverty. People poor are higher education, have a greater capacity to pull themselves and their families out of poverty. This is because an increase in human capital investment increases labor productivity and thus leads to greater learning potential. The relationship is reciprocal, no doubt. That is, people with higher incomes are more likely to invest in their children's education. And hence, the link between education and inequality. As most educated people not only have higher income, but also greater capacity to assert their rights. Education also can affect values and forms that shape our society. As such, education has a potential to achieve a greater gender equality. Gender equality prevents an intergenerational transmission of empowerment by breaking the cycle of early marriage and child rearing. Poor health and other risks associated with these events. Another possible link is between education and especially higher education and economic growth. Education raises innovation capacity and entrepreneurship, the backbones of industrial transformation, job building, and economic progress. At the same time, higher GDP growth translate into more resources for the 
transmission system, while industrial transportation boosts demand for skilled labor. And education also helps increase farm productivity and agricultural outcomes, which can improve nutrition and health outcomes. Specialized skills are very valuable for sustainable management, which is necessary element in achieving the goal of, for example, green energy or transsanitation or ecosystem conservation and climate change. Now, it's surprising that SDG 4 on education puts emphasis on the need for learners to acquire knowledge and skills needed to promote sustainable development. Because education is tightly intertwined with other aspects of human development, solutions to educational deficiencies that haunt many countries, often by within a broader framework. The framework includes improvement in political stability, strengthening human rights, facilitating an equal social safety net, creating a sound financial system, and building a resilient economy based on adequate incentive reward structure. With these crucial elements, and equitable quality education is difficult to achieve. Now, remind uh, of the preamble to UNESCO Constitution, which states, since wars in the minds of man, it is in the minds of man that the defenses of peace must be constructed. Now, I look at peace in a broader context, uh, context here. We are faced currently with different types of wars, ignorance, discrimination, social injustice. Against we need to construct defenses. We have faced recently, or we need to face coronavirus pandemic, incidents of social injustice and discrimination amongst others. Now, what we need to do is to construct defenses in such events, and the most effective means of defense we can adopt is education. That is, education of social equality and social justice, and put emphasis on the need to alleviate poverty. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ambassador Kakar, and thank you for that, for that link that you made to, to education as the one single factor that you would wish global investment and national investment to be directed towards. Uh, sometimes an unseen connection between the right to education and the entitlement to education is with the field of energy, because if you have a situation of energy poverty, how exactly are children, or for that matter, adults, going to be able to acquire any form of education, whether it is conventional or vocational? So to bring in that aspect of the importance of education, social justice, in terms of energy poverty, and in terms of community engagement, it's my privilege to invite Dr. Dimitrios Mavrakis, who is head of the Energy Policy Center at the National and Kapodistrian University of Athens, who's been the leader of the UNAI SDG hub on clean energy, and is also the founder of the Green Energy Investments Forum, which takes place every year. Professor Mavrakis. Well, uh, thank you very much for the nice words, uh, dear uh, Ermu. Uh, I'm afraid that I'm going to focus a little bit on the real uh, things because uh, all participants has uh, a very rich curriculum on those issues. So allow me to present you my so allow me to present you two initiatives. 
So my intervention concerns two initiatives relevant to our discussion, I hope. The first concerns the combination of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations with efforts to protect biodiversity, while the second targets the combat of energy poverty in a sustainable dimension through the proposed structured policy dialogue. Both initiatives aim to explore ways to increase the extrovert cooperation of academia with society for the common benefit. The first initiative has the title 75 UN does 75 trees unite hub SDG 7. The origin of this initiative lays on the exchange of ideas with uh, Mr. Ramuda Modaram, head of UNAI, in Athens last October 2019. In this frame, on the occasion of the 75th UN anniversary, the UNAI Hub SDG 7 has released the initiative 75 UN 75 Trees Unite Hub SDG 7. It is addressed to governments, municipalities, academic institutions, and all type of legal entities, inviting them to undertake to plant, care, and register 75 trees, or multiples of 75, to the UNAI Hub SDG 7 registry. In the meantime, UNAI Hub SDG 7, through the Permanent International Secretariat, of the Black Sea Economic Cooperation Organization, the so-called BSEC, has invited its 12 member states to join this initiative. Four of them, Azerbaijan, Bulgaria, Moldova, Turkey, and 19 Greek municipalities have expressed their official intention to join the initiative so far. If this initiative results to a large number of planted trees, then we could examine the case of issuing CO2 emission reduction certificates. This will be a net contribution in favor of biodiversity and the combat against climate change. In addition, it can be supportive to low-income people who will undertake to care after those trees. So, while I have presented you an initiative, to be sincere, I have outlined you an initiative supportive of the biodiversity, if properly expanded, it can contribute to increase the ambition of ordinary people to combat climate change and be supportive to efforts to relieve poverty among low-income people. The second initiative has the title Combating Energy Poverty in a Sustainable Dimension, a much more complicated issue. To start with, it is worth mentioning that this initiative is related at least with a number of sustainable development goals, such as those SDG 7, SDG 1, 13, 3, 12. Having in mind that policies and measures to tackle energy poverty depend on the socioeconomic status of a country, the aim is the transformation of energy consumers suffering from energy poverty into sustainable consumers a term referring to an entity combining the qualities of consumer and prosumer, producer. The aim is achieved by the intervention of local municipalities that aggregate energy poor consumers in legal entities that uh, through the proposed structured policy dialogue undertake to develop and implement feasible project proposals leading through the smart finance and smart building procedures to zero energy buildings. The structured policy dialogue is the process that allows the overcome of initial behavioral obstacles 
demonstrated by the potential beneficiaries, their aggregation into legal entities, and the gradual engagement of governmental, regulatory, and market actors in developing and implementing feasible project proposals. The development of project proposals should reflect the local socioeconomic conditions, follow the procedures of smart financing and smart building with the aim to upgrade the existing building stocks up to near zero energy level and cover the remaining energy needs of households with the use of renewable energy sources installed in situ or remotely through distributed energy network facilities. A successful implementation of such initiatives facilitates low-income households to satisfy their energy needs in a sustainable way, relieves public authorities from annual subsidies, normalizes the function of energy market, contributes to the green transformation of local economy, increases the ambition to combat climate change, lowers social tensions, which is very important in our times. And last but not least is that uh, it has the potential of quick support of the whole construction chain, including the creation of jobs in areas with low income, especially in this period of global economic recession. I conclude underlining the role that academia can play in motivating policy makers and market stakeholders to develop and implement those initiatives, having in mind that financing conditions vary indeed between developed and underdeveloped or less developed countries. And this brings me to my last comment that academia can undertake the role to increase its contribution as both knowledge and green fund transfer facilitator to our countries and especially to those with developing and less developed economies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mavrakis. And thank you for linking the SDGs to the amelioration of social tensions and also to the direct connection you made between academic work and academic research and the important concepts of the integrated sustainable development goals. I'd now like to ask Lenise, Lenise Collins, to introduce our survey on UN75 and moderate the remainder of the program. Lenise. Hi there, morning everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, as Ramu mentioned, um, one of the things that we strive to do via these dialogues is to get feedback from you uh, and to understand how uh, the academic community is interacting with uh, the SDGs and UN 75. Uh, so one of the things that we'd like to do is um, for those who um, are interested is to take part in our UN 75 survey. Uh, and my colleague Brenda has added it to the chat box. You'll see a link there and you'll uh, notice that um, you can just click on it and it will take you directly to the UN 75 um, website. So if you just uh, log in there, it's very easy, it's very fast. Um, and you can see that uh, there are just a few questions. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you can select your language, um, and there are a number of uh, languages, dozens of languages in which you can take the survey. You don't have to take it in English. So you can select your survey, and there are five quick questions uh, that the survey asks you to uh, to share, to participate in, including what you think the international community should prioritize to recover from COVID-19, from the pandemic. Uh, and you can select up to three things, and you can also enter something there in the box um, if you have other ideas. Um, it, the survey also asks that you look at the world you would want to see in 25 years when the UN turns 100. Uh, and what three things would you most want to see in the world 
in 25 years. Uh, and you can see there's a list there that includes uh, greater equality between countries, gender equality, environmental protection, uh, a number of, of issues. And you can also enter your own answer there. Um, what global trends do you think will most affect our future? Again, you can select up to three. Uh, and then just your idea of how important it is for countries to work together to address the, the trends that we spoke of and that are listed above, and whether COVID-19 has changed your views on cooperation between countries. Um, you can also leave a message for the uh, UN Secretary General uh, in terms of what your advice would be on how to address these trends. So what will this survey be used for? Uh, we're having this global dialogue around the world and your answers will be collated and presented in a report to the UN General Assembly in September. So please do uh, take the time to fill out that survey. It's really important that we hear from you uh, and we're very much looking forward to the inputs uh, from everyone. Uh, so now without further ado, we'll continue with our program um, and I will go to our next our next speaker. <clears throat> uh, Dr. Fazal Ahmad Khan is the pro vice chancellor of Balochistan University of Information Technology, Engineering and Management Sciences in Pakistan, which serves as the UNAI SDG hub for goal eight. Uh, and he has worked extensively on how empowering youth and entrepreneurship skills can help address poverty. So Dr. Ahmad Khan, I invite you to take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Um, yeah, sure. Um, we at, at Butums, we, the acronym for the university is Butums Quetta. Uh, we are located close uh, to the Afghanistan border um, and the south of Pakistan to, with, with the Arabian Sea. Um, our, our contribution for the, for the past eight years has been more focused on, on microeconomics and the economic development of the, the region particularly. And we also work with, with uh, people coming in from, from Afghanistan and, and the interior of the province of Balochistan and in other provinces of Pakistan. Uh, most of our campus community, the, the students, they come from, from un, underprivileged backgrounds and, and they come in and uh, study higher education. The points that, I, I, that I've been scribbling uh, uh, over the weekend of, of the impact that higher education can make in, in uh, alleviating poverty, um, I, I think, uh, and this has been a debate over the past quite a few years at, at our, uh, at our uh, faculty. Um, one, 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 one fact is obvious that, that, uh, that there, is the, there, there is the direct impact of the Higher Education Commission. Uh, I mean, I mean the, 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 the students enrolled at any higher education university uh, at, higher, at, at any institute of higher learning uh, they're, they're in thousands. For example, um, an average university in Pakistan enrolls about over 10,000 students. Uh, for example, at Butung, we have over 11,000 students enrolled. And uh, so, so a student enrolled at, uh, at, a, at an ETI, um, that the, the, the countries that, that we work in, uh, I mean, in the developing world, uh, they come from households uh, we call uh, the joint family system in which that students coming from a household uh, that has on average about 18 to 20 people in the household. So, so when you're enrolling a student coming from that household, you're directly transforming um, uh, the future of that household. And, and uh, in my little experience of, of the past few years, uh, we've had uh, students who who are coming, for example, there, there is a student uh, who has just graduated uh, a couple of years back. He, was, he used to work for, for an automobile paint shop uh, in the suburbs of, of, the, of the city. And uh, somehow our, one of our faculty members um, got him enrolled at the university. He was sponsored by the university's financial assistance. He got graduated 
he came from a very underprivileged background. And once he graduated, and he comes from a household of about 25 people. So when, when he graduated, he's now employed at, at a good reputed organization. He studied fine arts at the university. And now he produces beautiful uh, fine art paintings, which are sold to, uh, to corporate sector, to, to organizations, which are helping him earn very decent li livelihood. So, so when you graduate a student, you're effectively uh, giving producing decent work for, for, for a huge household in, in the developing world. So one, one fact is obvious. Uh, I think the, the other thing that, that is associated with, with uh, higher education um, uh, learning is, is that you were, you were graduating students who were more uh, responsible citizens of the society. Um, they're more responsible towards uh, the environment. They are more responsible towards deciding on the, on the family size of their family, their future family. And they're also responsible in transforming the future of over 20 people in that household. So you're literally transforming in a, in a period of about 10 years time. If you ensure good quality higher education, you are literally transforming um, tens of thousands of, of such households and literally affecting millions of such uh, population. Um, in, in, in my view also, um, the other fact which, which we tend to forget sometimes is, is in, in, again in the developing world, is the role that these universities can play as, as the commons of the society. I compare these universities to, to, for example, these are platforms for the society, for the citizens of, of the developing world, where these citizens can talk about uh, the, the social injustices. Uh, these, these higher education institutions can bring, and they do bring policy makers into dialogue. Uh, the, these spaces are more accessible to, to the people uh, of the developing world. Uh, compare more accessible compared to a government office, for example, or, or a financial institution, for example. Uh, compared to such uh, spaces, a university or its, its uh, seminar halls or classrooms are more accessible to, to, to that section of the society. And, and, uh, and that critical dialogue uh, when fostered by these institutions can, can help uh, improving uh, the, the decision-making process and the policy-making process in, in the developing world, especially, and, 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 and helping in improving the, the economy of the underprivileged class. Um, and, and I also would try to highlight the importance of, of the role of faculty uh, for, for us as a faculty member. Um, I think Muhammad Yunus uh, and his Grameen Bank has, has been a paragon of, of the role of faculty can play uh, in transforming uh, the economics of the underprivileged class. Um, unfortunately, um, faculty, um, especially in the developing world, so far what I've, what I've observed is, is, uh, is, has been has been more compelled to be interested in making publications um, than making a real impact on the society. And that is alarming. Uh, I, I wanted to mention and highlight this here uh, and people and want to let, to let people know that we need to work on this thing, especially the, the higher education regulators in the developing world, especially um, to, to, to to create an environment where a, a faculty member, a professor um, who makes an impact on the society is rewarded um, uh, with, with, with that work, which, which might not be directly publishable, for example, um, but, 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 but that reward process needs to be rethought about in, in, among the, the regulators of higher education. In, 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 uh, in, 
in the in the developing world especially um and and also um um and also i think in the governments in the developing world they have to think about about uh, rewarding and appreciating um and developing a culture for for faculty who who can make an impact not in publications but an impact that is directly uh, transforming the economics of the underprivileged class uh in 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 the society and and, and also at, at the same time uh the government of the, in the developing world they have the government have to the governments have to think of of giving critical space to the higher education institutions of the developing world in, in making in making important decisions and deciding the future of the society future of the nation that is also of critical importance what i've seen and learned over the past few years is that the governments in the developing world have have a serious disconnect with academic institutions of higher learning and uh, and what happens in the in the institutions of higher learning never goes into the into the decision or policy making process of the governments of of these countries um so that is equally very important and there, there are excellent examples where universities um in in such parts of the world have have played are playing very important roles and and we need to we need to replicate such examples in 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 other parts of of our, our planet and uh, and and with that um with that i i wish that uh, that higher education institutions all across the world uh can realize the importance of making real impact on on bringing um the 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 less privileged class of of our global citizens uh together and they 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 learn um in 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 such institutions and, and help building uh a better world a more educated world and a more tolerant world and responsible world thank you very much dr khan thank you so much uh for that intervention i think what you said really resonates with uh people on the call um in terms of the unique position that universities are in to lift people out of poverty that they're more accessible for many people than you know being able to get a loan or financial assistance from a bank or being able to enter the halls of government that's not an avenue that is accessible but you know people can enroll can enroll in a class people can take a massive online course so how do we you know integrate that into government policy and decision making and everything that's happening at universities as a key avenue to uh, alleviating poverty and as you said lifting entire families uh out of poverty and making their lives better and i think that's going to be very um rich fodder for our discussion when we have our our moderated discussion so thank you so much for that um i'd like to turn now to um an amazing young woman who is um a Millennium Campus Network fellow. She's a student at Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology in in Ghana and she's majoring in natural resources management with a a focus on agroforestry. Um her name is Esther Oritieku. Uh she's also an entrepreneur and co-founder of a non-profit organization known as Shelve the Books uh Ghana. and the focus of her nonprofit is on increasing child literacy in both rural and urban communities and using education to combat child poverty so esther i'd like to invite you to take the floor thank you um i'm very honored to join us today um and i'm I want to thank um, the United Nations Impact and MCN for this great opportunity. I also want to thank us all for making time in joining us today. Personally, I believe that the youth are most affected by the issues of poverty and for us as individuals that have had some form of higher education, we are in the position to come up with innovative ideas 
and also initiatives to help combat the issue of poverty and ensure social justice wherever we find ourselves. But most of the time, we as students have um, given the sole responsibility to our government, um, our private entities, our uh, uh, religious organizations, and most of the times, uh, non-governmental institutions to really come up with ideas and also interventions to help solve the social issue of <laughs> poverty and also ensure social justice at the long run. But I want to encourage us as, as students and also as young individuals who have had some form of experience, we can also have simple, simple ideas and some simple, simple initiatives that can go a long way in helping curb this issue of poverty and also um, ensure social justice. Um, me personally, I started my whole initiative after I was privileged to volunteer with um, VSO ICS on a three months duration project where I was placed in one of the rural parts of Ghana for a three months duration. So um, after my whole voluntary experience, I got to actually stay with host parents. The conditions there were very um, different from what I enjoyed at home. So coming back home, I started thinking about ways I could um, actually impact positively in the lives of people in my own very little way. I became very passionate about education. And I felt like when people are empowered or have access to education, they can actually achieve more for themselves. So I came back home, I started speaking with friends and we came up with this initiative, Shelf the Books, where we've been able to raise over 500 plus reading books and also some substantial amount of money that was used in purchasing um, extra teaching and learning materials for these rural community schools. So at the long run, we really impacted positively in our own way. We, with regards to how we raised the books, we just spoke to a couple of um, institutions in our urban areas, teachers and parents who had kids that have books that were in good condition, but were not in use because maybe they had passed that grade or level but the books were in right condition. So we spoke to them and they actually donated these books. And it has been very helpful and useful to these rural community schools. We further went on to um, adopt a kindergarten school, also in that rural community school, that really had issues with um, uh, issues in their schools. So the school was basically very dull colored they didn't really have access to teaching and learning materials and playing materials. And we felt like for kindergarten education, most students learn more whilst they play. So my friends and I came up together and um, we generated some funds by getting people new and other institutions. And, other institutions. and at the long run, we were able to create a very conducive environment for these kids. And it was surprising that parents in that community also came together to also raise funds to build a, a playground for the kids. So in our own little way, we were able to um, impact positively. And we also challenged these parents to invest more into the education of these kids. So I want us as youth and as students who are still in the university to understand that um, in our own very little way, in our own very simple ideas, we can really go a long way in combating poverty. Some of us have skills that we could actually um, teach other people in our community. We shouldn't focus very much on the numbers we are going to impact, but we should understand that starting from a point, we can really create impact at the long run. And um, I want us to also, uh, as youth and as students that have had some form of higher education, do not trivialize um, this opportunity because there are thousands and millions of people who have not really had access to the kind of knowledge you have got. So at the long run, we shouldn't be selfish, that's the, the, the whole thing, but we should start thinking in your community, what have you identified that in your own little way can contribute to change? It might not be very significant, but I, I believe that you'll be causing change in your own very small way 
And um, finally, I want to um, encourage our university students who are still in school to take advantage of uh, the Millennium Fellowship. So it's a semester long uh, leadership program, which I was privileged to have been selected in 2019 to join. And it has been very, very instrumental in my life because I've met a lot of great young individuals all around the globe doing great initiatives. And this family connects you with people who are really inspiring change in, their, in diverse ways. Think about in agriculture, think about education, think about everything. All they are doing is they want to help combat this issue of poverty and also ensure social justice in their very little way. So I uh, will encourage you also to take advantage. Thank you for your time. Esther, um, that is amazing and incredibly um, inspiring, the work that you're doing. And I think the point that you made about um, students, you, there's nothing that's too small. There's no activity um, that is, you know, too little that you can undertake. And if we get thousands of young people doing that in their communities around the world, you can have a huge impact. So that's um, incredibly um, inspiring what, what you've done. Um, I would like, before I turn to Dr. Baudry, I would just like to yes. remind people that we have, um, we will have a discussion um, after Dr. Baudry speaks. So if you have any questions for any of our panelists, please write them in the chat box and we will um, propose them to the panelists to answer because we also like to have a discussion. But uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker who, ha who has joined us, uh, Dr. Balgis Baldry. Dr. Badri is the director of the Regional Institute for Gender, Diversity, Peace and Rights at Afad University for Women in Sudan, which serves as the UNAI hub, SDG hub for SDG goal five. Dr. Badri has taught and published on the gender dimensions to poverty and social justice, the role of academia in promoting women's inclusion and the need to mainstream gender in government policy to ensure that gender equality is, a, is part of the basis for alleviating poverty. Dr. Baudry, welcome, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Yes, hello, good, good afternoon. Um, well, I, I would like to emphasize issues of uh, the feminization of poverty. And uh, by this, we mean the lack of different capabilities in health, in education, in income, in property ownership, and uh, and in having a voice actually to to reach to the decision takers and and so on and so forth. Uh, for so, and there are uh, different reasons, of course, for the feminization of poverty from uh, lack of government policies and commitment to patriarchal and sociocultural aspects and, and conflict also is one of the major reasons for the uh, increase in, in poverty. What we have done here at Ahfad University are, uh, are diverse. A part is uh, research, the students themselves, as well as the staff with policymakers and uh, some uh, UN agencies like FAO and WFP. We undertake uh, researches. Uh, the researches would be of different types, identification of the poor households, uh, uh, having them have a voice, creating a partnership, uh, establishing uh, CCOs, uh, community-based uh, uh, associations, as, as well as uh, other means of doing the uh, bottom-up participatory uh, research. And here I would like to emphasize the importance of a bottom-up participatory research as well as the development uh, of, uh, and, uh, of partnership with either the research is for policymakers or for business people. There should be very clear uh, targets of how first university students could help in the research, in monitoring, in evaluation, in identification and all of this. And one of our experiences is doing uh, urban uh, urban agriculture for poor households in Khartoum state itself in the uh, a bit of the suburbs of Khartoum state 
and that actually had led to uh, alleviation of, of, of poverty through these backyard gardens. Uh, students also formed their own NGOs and the students of medicine actually worked uh, with, uh, they formed an association called Mawadda and they worked with women in, uh, in prisons. Uh, women in prisons actually, and they have done what we consider not a crime because they were put into uh, the prison because of uh, beer brewing, brewing traditional uh, alcohol. And this is a very good way of uh, actually surviving strategies. But according to the past the government, this is illegal. And so we, the students helped them to bring some kind of commodities which they could uh, work on it and uh, turn it into goods. And the students would bring the raw materials as well as sell them and uh, support the families of these uh, uh, present women who are mostly female-headed households. Uh, other aspects of, of trying to do is awareness raising and capacity building. Also, Ahfad University worked on this issue of capacity building. And uh, now we are going to have uh, this uh, DDR, uh, the um, disarmament and, uh, and integration. And uh, so we are working with the military and the police on really how to reach to the families of those who are going to be disarmed. And uh, this is something important. I think all universities uh, where there are conflicts, they could work on, on this aspect to make the military and police themselves sensitive to the need of, of uh, families and to create a kind of a transitional justice. Uh, another aspect of a, a project we have undertaken is trying to work uh, in schools. Uh, secondary schools uh, in suburban areas where the areas are actually very very poor and dense populated uh, also areas and uh, we work with them through different um, programs one is trying to reach to the uh, families of the poor students themselves to give them a kind of a rotating uh, capital and uh, to create from them a, a strong group and to help them in marketing uh, also to to reach to the dropout uh, girls and attach them to uh, some of the companies that are interested to give them uh, training and then later on capital from their uh, social responsibility funds and then working with the students themselves uh, to help them uh, have uh, clubs of dialogue, of debates, of narrative theater, uh, so as to strengthen their uh, uh, leadership capacities and ambition to go to beyond the secondary schools and not to drop out. And uh, so these are uh, different kinds of, of, of aspects that uh, people could undertake. Be besides that, there are master programs and short training courses. We have got a microfinance uh, training course and this microfinance uh, actually is uh, targeting women in, in banks and it has been undertaken yes. in uh, cooperation with the Central Bank of Sudan uh, so that the banks would be sensitive to give credit to, to females uh, and especially to target female-headed households. And uh, so this is one of the programs, uh, besides the programs on uh, gender, peace and development, where also we give uh, students expertise into issues of uh, uh, being gender sensitive in, in all their programs and policies. Um, uh, another uh, experience of the university is establishing NGOs. We established a women NGO and we established a youth NGO. And the idea is that students, as well as the staff, as well as members from the uh, society in general, would join. the NGOs are registered as independent NGOs, but they are stationed uh, their premises within the university itself. And uh, these NGOs actually did quite a lot of work on poverty alleviation and other aspects of capacity building for women. And uh, even they had branches outside uh, Khartoum State and they had links with different international uh, and national organizations. 
for so this is one of the the other aspect is now we are developing a, a program for trying to the poor students who are given uh, scholarships actually they are it is not something that they are going to return it is free admission uh, we are trying now to work uh, to, with them in starting a kind of a small uh, business project with their families while they are students so that by the time they graduate they have uh, their families have would have got their own business and so the students will not fall into unemployment and uh, this might also help in uh, making them exit from poverty th these families for the uh, final aspects is that the students themselves our students would uh, to encourage them to have a voice uh, we create clubs for uh, for dialogue, for debates, uh, for uh, narrative theater, and all these kinds, and the school gardening, and family attachment. For so students, each student has to attach her to herself to a family, so as to see how that family do, uh, especially students of medicine and health sciences, and the students of business administration and psychology. For so they attach themselves to family, so as uh, to help these families, that, to encourage them to have access to education and to health and not to drop out and not to have early marriages. For, so these are all kind of uh, experiences that we have uh, uh, undertaken and uh, uh, maybe I would stop here to uh, have some time for questions. Wonderful, Dr. Badri, thank you so much for that intervention and describing the work that you all are doing at AFAD. And what I take from what you said, um, what Dr. Khan said, uh, what Esther has said, is about the importance of operationalizing, taking these theoretical ideas that you learn into a classroom and taking them out into the community to start NGOs, to work on concrete pot projects. Dr. Mavrakis also talked about this in terms of doing concrete specific things. So I think that this is an incredible um, sort of call to action to people in the academic community that, you know, being in the classroom, you know, as Dr. Khan said, this idea for professors that it's publish or perish, and they're so focused on, you know, publishing that the concrete translating what young people learn into concrete action is a step that may be missing. And so it's incredibly um, inspiring to hear all the work that you all are doing in terms of taking that education and showing students how to turn it into actual concrete action in the community. Uh, so that's incredibly inspiring. Uh, please write your questions. We already have uh, a question for um, from one of our participants uh, that I will pose to the panelists. Uh, but just quickly, I first wanted to start off um, with Ambassador Kakar. I wanted to follow up with you on something because you spoke so eloquently about the fact that eradicating poverty is a cross-cutting issue, but if you had to address just one thing, it would be education, particularly education for girls. Um, Ambassador Karkar, what impact do you think COVID-19 and the disruption that it has had on education will have in terms of addressing poverty? Do you think that we're going to lose ground in that area? Thank you very much for that question. Yes, I. At the moment, I think the situation is rather fluid and unclear, but fear is that uh, the education sector, poverty, education, and the important issues like that might get sidetracked. So I'm particularly now working on putting out a book on SDGs implementation at the Pace University School of Law. And this is a point where sort of raising in each chapter of each SDG to see how it pandemic uh, coronavirus affect implementation of the SDGs. My fear is that uh, resources might be diverted to uh, um, areas like taking care of and pandemic, uh, what have you, that we may distract from 
um, major issues of, like poverty education, education, uh, provision of social services like health, what have you. So yes, I'm concerned about it. I'm, I'm trying to raise it everywhere. Thank you so much, Ambassador, uh, for that. And I think that's something that we have to keep in mind as we as we try to recover uh, from the pandemic and as we, we move to sort of, you know, rebuild what kind of ground have we lost in terms of social justice, in terms of education to advance those issues. So thank you so much for that. Um, we have a question from, from a participant, Ruben uh, Sapetulu, who wants to know, um, Professor Khan, perhaps you could address this issue because Ruben's question is you have so many young people who, who start NGOs, who, who want to do good in the community, but they also cannot support themselves, that they need a financial source of income. So Dr. Khan, do you have any ideas about how to, how young people can balance, you know, um, doing social good in the community, uh, but also, you know, the realistic fact that people have to support families and they have to make money and they often can't find the financing and the support to get their NGO off the ground or to support it. I, I think uh, I think um, financially uh, financial stability of a change maker is important. Um, in order to in order to make an impact on the society, I think you need to first work on your footing uh, to make your own stability um, is is crucial first. I, I think work needs to be done at least to ensure that uh, one is sustainable um, um, so that um, so that you can you can work towards your passion um, I, I think as a change maker you you have to address that thing first uh, before uh, making um, your journey toward that endeavor I think I think the change maker has to address that thing first um, um, to, to, to ensure some financial stability as, as a person, as an individual of the society. Um, once once, um, once that, that uh, financial surety, at least some of it should be ensured, uh, then you can start uh, working towards your, your passion. And, and I think in the process, um, uh, in the process, uh, when when you start your journey towards towards your passion, I, I think uh, when when you were dedicated towards it, um, at the end of the day, you're going you're going to make yourself sustainable and your household sustainable in in the long term. Uh, to me, I think practically practically speaking, um, that is a prerequisite before you you make that endeavor. You need to make financial stability. Uh, so so I'm just just talking about from the perspective of, of an individual for an, an individual but of course if you, if you think about the larger picture i, I think um, the governments have to think about this thing uh, the reward process uh, for such the appreciation for such people that that has to be thought about by by the government by by the international organization, by the United Nations, which which is already doing a wonderful um, job in that regard. But I think that that has to be in the larger picture of things. Uh, these stakeholders have to think about this thing. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Khan. And I think it's so true what you're saying about the need for um, you know, financial stability and creating that space for change makers to be able to contribute in that way without, you know, worrying about the financial implications. Um, Ambassador Kakar, I see that you have your hand raised. Uh, would you like to also weigh in on, on that particular point? Oh, Me? Ambassador, Me? you're muted. If you could just unmute. It's a major problem of uh, availability resources for NGOs. Many of do very, very good work. But uh, one major obstacle is lack of awareness. 
in this society, civil society, about the need to do a certain action and uh, uh, certain developmental activities and what have you, particularly poverty alleviation, education, health. So I think one of the aspects which NGOs, not NGOs, be taking care of is creating awareness about the issues, about the problems. So they should probably try to do that at the same time. And once awareness is created, maybe channels resources would open, some channels or resources could be open. Thank you. I would Thank like you to so much. Um, Dr. Mavrakis, I see that you also had your hand raised. I just wanted to give you an opportunity to uh, weigh in on, on any of those questions if you wanted to uh, make a comment. So, uh, thank you. I think that the, uh, uh, yes, 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 we hear you. Okay, I think that uh, the most important issue when we are talking about uh, the fight against poverty is uh, the financial basis that is developed to uh, do this. So, first of all, we have to consider how can we provide uh, funds to th those areas and how to provide the funds and funding uh, to those particular parts of our societies. One of the most uh, difficult issues is to communicate with them. Because when you try to explain something complicated, you face behavioral barriers. So when we say that uh, young people, they want to do, and I do believe they want to do something, those young people, those their uh, NGOs should be incorporated in broader projects, targeting the, uh, with concrete uh, aims what they want to do with poor people. I mean, it's not a question of charity. It's not a question of inspiration. It's a question of programmed action. So if we are talking about developed, uh, underdeveloped or less developed countries, we have to be sure that uh, the Green Climate Fund can provide the appropriate uh, money for those activities. And uh, we have to be sure that uh, we can understand the complexity of the bureaucracy of the Green uh, Climate Fund. So th those from the academia that they want really to help uh, poor people, poor households, they have to provide their knowledge in managing those complicated and difficult tasks. Otherwise, we cannot make a real, uh, a, a, real, a real difference. So this is my, uh, my opinion concerning this. Uh, and I think uh, it is a great opportunity to think how to do something at the end of this meeting. Dr. Mavrakis, thank you so much for that, um, that call to action about how do we leave this meeting with actual, you know, a call to action. Dr. Badri, I see um, that you might have your hand raised. I have a question for you as well, specifically. Someone wants to, a, a young person works on gender-based violence um, and says that they feel that that community is very close-knit and they don't have a way to access that community. What are your suggestions for people who want to get involved in these issues but can't really find a way to, to crack what seem to be these very close-knit groups of people who are working on these issues? Uh, and please uh, weigh in on any other topics that, um, that folks have raised. Yes. Okay, I, I think what is important is the training for students. Students have to get training on these issues of gender-based violence, on credit, on reaching to the poor, and there should be courses given to the students, either as compulsory courses or not. We at Ahfad, we have got many university requirement courses related to, to raise the capacities and on, on, on this, say, for example, a course on women's studies is given and where issues of gender-based violence also is given. Uh, also, for, uh, referring to the staff themselves, 
one of the criteria for promotion is not just publication, but also civic engagement of the staff. Uh, so what, what I, I would like to, to, to hear, uh, to emphasize two things, is the link. Is students, if they would like to reach to any community, whether for poverty or for uh, poverty plus, which includes violence against women and all these kind of things, they can integrate with NGOs. They have to register themselves with established NGOs. When they register themselves with established NGOs, through these NGOs, then they will get the training and the access and they could work as, as volunteers and uh, during their uh, summer holidays, attachments and things like that. So this is one of the important things whereby uh, the, and, and, and if they want to establish their own uh, NGO, then also staff and other experts who could volunteer and help them of how to write a project proposal and how to uh, take these proposals to different donors who will um, actually support. And uh, there are many of the companies that give social responsibilities and these they don't need the NGO or the groups to be registered, formally registered NGOs. But so I think that what is what is needed is that the university staff themselves should learn about the different types of civic engagements and how NGOs are formed and the work of NGOs. And this should also be given to, to the students and to help them form their own their own clubs. That would be the step. Uh, for the uh, reaching to to the poor communities with violence against women, how is, uh, uh, students could reach to to that? One of the ways is to see an access through those who are uh, very very well respected uh, within the community itself, and and then gradually gradually to visit uh, the homes and to talk not on issues of violence at the beginning, so that they are not going to get. Uh, threatened by the males who, un who undertake the violence itself. And uh, gradually, gradually also trying to take these women as if they are taking them uh, to uh, visit a health care center or something like that, to where there are different NGOs working on trauma, on violence against women. And uh, so uh, I think that universities should be alert enough and to form their own. We have got a trauma center for uh, uh, those people uh, uh, who have experienced violence, whether women violence, domestic violence, or even some men who experience violence from security uh, guards and things like that. For so the, I, I think the most important thing is that uh, universities should make it part and parcel of its programs and of clubs and associations and training and uh, then linking the different students to different companies as well as to different well-established NGOs and uh, they should have their summer holidays attached to all these kind of things where they could find um, access to, to satisfy also what they they aspire for and how they could reach to, to this. So link with the established NGOs and, and do it during the, the your summer time or your days where you, you don't have any kind of lectures or something like that. So just universities have to make it part and parcel of its requirement, this civic engagement aspect so that we could graduate students who have got capacities to help others as well as to help themselves and their country. Jennifer Badri, thank you so much. Those are, are, are incredibly, um, you know, specific and concrete actions that young people can take to get involved, but also calling on universities and academia, as you said, to, to prepare students to be these, these global citizens, to prepare students to go out into the world uh, with this equipped with the skills to start their own enterprise or with the skills they have learned while in school doing working with NGOs, working with programs offered by their schools. So Renu, I hope that those those um, 
suggestions are helpful. We have a number of other questions, but we're running a little short on time. Uh, before I turn it over to Ramu, the Chief of, of Academic Impact, I did want to circle around to Esther to ask her, um, you know, any tips that she has for young people in terms of starting their own uh, NGO, their own program, and how do you scale it up? How do you find the funding? Esther, you mentioned that you got, you know, people to make local donations, that you found, you know, a corporate sponsor or that, you know. So Esther, what tips would you have uh, for those people? You know, Ruben wanted to know, how can you be a change maker uh, when it's hard to find financing and funding? So Esther, what what suggestions might you have for young people looking to do something like what you've done? Oh, okay, thank you. I want to touch on this, um, the social, um, corporate social responsibility. Most um, institutions have this responsibility towards their society. So for my initiative, we were able to draft a proposal, a very interesting proposal, and we submitted it. Um, and they really thought that, but at the long run, they gave us something. And I want to also touch on this because also use um, people you know. Okay, and I, I also want to touch on the fact that we being in the university, we have a wider network of people. So I also used my lecturers and my friends. I spoke to a couple of lecturers, a couple of friends that were also interested in the amount of money in the set a long way in making this very successful. So we could, we could actually make use of our university um, environment. Esther, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, we will be in touch with you to get some of um, the ideas that you mentioned in writing to share with the larger group. Um, because I think one of the things that you said was that, you know, you learned how to write a proposal to solicit uh, support for your project, which is exactly one of the things that Dr. Baudry says that, you know, you have to teach students how to propose ideas, how to get support for their ideas so that they can, you know, work with uh, companies that offer social, you know, responsibility programs and things like that. So I think this is... Um, really helpful. We are um, over time and um, uh, thank you all. I'm going to turn it over to Ramu for closing remarks, but we will send out a wrap up email with some resources uh, and ideas for, for you all. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ramu Damodaran. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Lenise, and thank you everyone for joining in this really stirring discussion. Uh, as Lenise mentioned, we apologize for the technical problems that we had in the course of the of the morning, but I'm glad we were able to overcome all of them. And as Lenise said, we will send a wrap-up email, including many of the points that you've put in the chat box. The whole idea of the series is rethinking. And when we think about think about rethinking poverty and social justice, I was really heartened by the number of ideas that came forward. Uh, Ambassador Narendra Kaka talking about rethinking poverty from the point of view of greater attention to gender equity in education. Professor Mavrak is talking about the idea of smart, smart city, smart energy, smart derived from education, so that you have adaptation, mitigation, and sustainability, which are not only taught, but practiced in the educational and academic community. Uh, Professor Fazal Ahmed Khan, who brought in the idea of rethinking poverty 
in the context of the family, the joint family, which is so much an institution in, in Pakistan as it is in other parts of South Asia. Of course, Dr. Badri, who talked about rethinking poverty from the point of view of rethinking laws. Should women who are brewing a liquor, which is traditional, be sent to jail and prison and thereby deprive them the chance of being productive, earning and contributing members of society? And of course, the presentation we had from Esther Tieku, where she had this wonderful phrase about change in small ways. That too is rethinking. Thinking that no matter how you perceive the change you, uh, you intend to do, however small you think it is, when you sit back and look at it from a global perspective, how large and meaningful it really becomes. I'd like to invite all of you to join our next webinar and conversation on the 19th of June, which really focuses on gender issues in the context of the 75th anniversary of the UN, and of course, rethinking gender from the prism of scholarship and education. But in the meanwhile, thank you all for joining us. And again, please do take the UN 75 survey if you can. Please keep in touch with us. Please visit our website, academicimpact.un.org. Let's keep the sustained conversation going. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.